the writer here, Jude, he cites two extra biblical works about Moses. It's called the Testament of Moses mm -hmm. around the, the first apostolic age. So the focus here is in uh, verses 6 and 7, obviously. So he talks about these angels that they, they did not keep or guard their own rule, principality, but they left that domain, that dominion, uh, and God has kept guarded in perpetual chains. Mm -hmm. Now you see the contrast there? Because mm -hmm. they couldn't guard their own post, now God has them under guard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's an interesting shift that happened. Mm -hmm. He talks about this perpetual change or eternal bond some translations have in. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously a reference to imprisonment in Peter. Peter talks about imprisoned spirits. And also uh, Azazel in the Enoch story, First Enoch chapter 10, the, one of the leaders is bound hand and foot and the rest of the rebe rebelling angels are also bound for 70 generations, says Enoch. And then they're kept under gloomy darkness. So obviously this is a somewhere below the earth or the netherworld, Tartarus. And why are they kept there? Awaiting the judgment, the great day. Well, what other day would that be? Well, the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now that's throughout the minor prophets, uh, Joel, uh, Malachi, Zephaniah, Acts 2.20 also talks about the day or the day of the Lord. And Enoch as well, interestingly enough. Both books, the first and second Enoch. So these are examples, right? This whole letter, if you read the whole letter, Jude starts talking about the people who were disobedient in the Old Testament as an example, as a typos, as a type, right? Mm -hmm. Don't be like them. And furthermore, even angels, right, disobeyed. So that's the context here of Jude. He's trying to get us to heed the warning that even angels went astray. Like Sodom, Gomorrah, and surrounding cities, they, that is the angels, through the sexual union, they went after different flesh. Actually, it's Jude who talks about this different flesh or alien flesh. So it's not just about homosexuality, by the way. We know in Sodom and Gomorrah, depravity all over the place. But these particular beings were after different flesh. Actually, many evangelicals use this as, as a cudgel against uh, homosexuality. Mm -hmm. But it's actually different flesh. It's, it's a much rarer form of the Greek there. It's not sodomy as such. There is sodomy, sodomites, but this is different flesh. Deuteronomy 32. This is similar, by the way, similar theme here of Jude. This is the, the rotten way to go. Don't do this. So the interesting thing here is that this uh, verse 8, children of Israel, some have sons of Israel. I think that's the only appearance of that phrase in, in the Hebrew there, in the Masoretic. But the interesting thing is that in the <clears throat> Greek translation, it's actually sons of God, B'nai Elohim. You see the contrast? It's similar to Genesis 6. So the Greek translators might be seeing a connection there that at one point when God set the boundaries, let's say frontiers, so this group will live here, whatever, he also set in each nation, let's call it, a sort of guardian angel. If we're taking sons of God here, I'm taking the LXX, the Greek version. So the story goes that God uh, set up in each nation and the, he set them up with an angel and if you see the story in Daniel 10 uh, remember when the king of Persia anyway that story there you can compare it to these angels might have had that responsibility of keeping watch keeping guard over certain nations and they left their domains and that's a big no-no right when we disobey God so these are supports for the Sons of God as type of angel called the watchers and the downfall. So let's start in verse 1, 2 Peter 2. First of all, the hell issue. How influential. I'll call it ancient Catholicism. So I'm going back to the councils, right? 
the, the, the best known I see are how influential they are to this day. Mm -hmm. That they have mistranslated a word that has nothing to do with Hades, which is usually hell, right? It's Hades with Tartarus. The word there in, in verse 4 is, they are sent to a place called Tartarus, a place of gloom, the netherworld, right? Most translations I found mistranslate that as hell. Well, why? Because if you go back to the Apostles' Creed, remember that ancient creed, late 2nd century, they believed that Jesus went down to preach to dead people. Guess mm -hmm. where? In hell. So to this day, even the modern uh, version Bibles, like the NASB and, and so on, mistranslate that word because that word is key to this whole um, Genesis 6 situation. Mm -hmm. Tartaros is a well-known Greco-Roman world. It, it's, again, it's a world of the underworld, the netherworld, it's where Charis the guy that, that ferried the dead souls and uh, Cerberus or Kerberus, the three-headed dog is down there. And rich word with a lot of history, a lot of ancient history, a lot of mythological history. Now why pray tell if we're not pagans <laughs> would Peter borrow that word? Because he wanted to get a point across. What is the point? First of all, that it's a prison. You know, it's a place of gloom and darkness. Second of all, Maybe because what's in it is so supernatural, is so inhuman, let's call it. And these are the spirits in prison. The Greek connection, let's call it. So if you look at, I think it's also in Homer, it appears, uh, Tartarus and so on. But if you can read that passage there for the, there's a thing called the Theogony which is circa 8th century BC, so this is going way back. This account by a guy called Hesiod. Uh, there was a war of the Titans. This is a Greco-Roman myth. Uh, mythology is rich with this. That the gods of Olympus then went to war with these Titans or giants and then they won out and guess what happened to the Titans or the giants? Similar situation, right? As Genesis 6. No, I'm not saying Genesis 6 is borrowing from that event. I think the Genesis 6 is very much a real event that happened. But uh, maybe the reverse happened. Maybe the Greeks and the Romans and whoever else, uh, Mesopotamians and so on, maybe they knew about those stories and introduced them into their cultures. There's also an airy Tartarus, by the way. So Tartarus is underground, but I also found that Enoch talks about Tartar as being in the second heaven. Now we know that Jewish cosmology has levels. For example, Paul in 2 Corinthians, I think chapter 12 about, I know a man who was transferred or took, taken up to the third heaven and, and so on. And I think he saw about himself, by the way. But it's a vision, it's a, it's a revelation. So I don't think he was disembodied or something, or he doesn't know. But the point is that the, the Tartarus uh, place is also in, in the heavens, it sounds like. This would explain the prince of the power of the air, by the way, mm -hmm. and the reference to the Cosmocrator in Ephesians uh, 6, which is the domain mm. of, of angels.